Welcome to Why I Left, a podcast that explores the great resignation. I'm your host, Brian Akar. Join me as I chronicle real stories from real people about the reasons they decided to leave their jobs during the pandemic and what has happened since. Warning. If you struggle with self-harm or experience suicidal thoughts, the following episode could be potentially triggering. If you or a loved one is struggling or has concerns about their mental health, know that there are ways to get help. Here are some resources. In the United States, you can dial 911 if you need emergency help. Or you can text the crisis text line by texting HELLO, H-E-L-L-O, to 741 741. Lastly, you could reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by calling 1 800 273 TALK. That's 1 800 273 TALK. If you're in England, you can dial 999 if you need emergency help. Or you can reach out to the NHS by dialing 111 on the telephone. They're open 24 hours. Or you could reach out to Samaritans by dialing 116123. They too are open 24 hours. Thank you. Hello, and thanks for tuning into this episode of the Why I Left podcast. In today's episode, I chat with Joan Pons La Plana. Joe is a nurse and mental health activist originally from Spain who went to England to follow his dreams of helping people as a nurse in the national health system. Now, not only is he a highly decorated 20 plus year nurse and former Britain Nurse of the Year, but he's now on a mission to destigmatize mental health in the healthcare profession. Joe's candor about his mental health struggles is something that I really commend him for shining a light on. I hope you all enjoyed this impactful episode. Now, let's go check it out. All right, welcome. So, our guest today is Joan Pons La Plana. Joe is a veteran nurse mental health activist, and author of Destiny and Hope. He's been very open about his experiences during the pandemic, which he discusses in his book, and we'll get to that. I became aware of him on a hashtag great resignation thread that I follow, and he was gracious enough to accept my invitation to join the show. Now, Joe has a touching story about his experiences in healthcare during the pandemic and really what led him to join the great resignation. So I'm excited for him to share. So hi, Joe. How are you? I appreciate you joining us today. Hi, it's a pleasure, and it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for in- inviting me to let me tell the story of why I left, and hopefully that will help other nurses and other people who will listen to the podcast. Thank you. Now, before we get into this whole great resignation thing, I know it, it is really the hot topic, uh, but I would love to get a sense as to, and our listeners to get a sense as to who you are. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing and where you currently call home. Yeah, um, I was born in Spain, in Barcelona, a beautiful city. Um, I was there in my youth, and then I I, did, I went to university, I studied nursing, and then I did try to, you know, find a job that I could uh, fulfill my dream of being a nurse, and, and I couldn't. And, and that's why, at the end, you know, I took one of the hardest decisions in my life is to leave my hometown to pursue my dream. Like a lot of people to, um, was in, in their life, they want to, um, they have a dream, the, like the American dream. I went to the United Kingdom to pursue that dream. And I landed in Luton Airport uh, 20, nearly 22 years ago with 50 pounds in my pocket and a suitcase full of dreams. I never looked back uh, since since that day. I had a fantastic career here in the United Kingdom. I live now in Sheffield, is uh, the north of, the, of, of England, uh, close to Manchester for people who like football like myself. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I'm here for the last 22 years. Uh, I have uh, three beautiful children, I uh, have a fantastic job, but Unfortunately, as, uh, that's why I'm here at the podcast, because the pressure of the pandemic, I make the drastic decision for my mental health and also for my family to uh, leave the job I had done for 22 years that I love uh, with all my heart. And that also was one of the hardest decisions, but I needed to do it because otherwise the end will have been a lot worse than it, it, it has been. Yeah. And now, and you know, and we're definitely, I, I want to definitely dig in, into that shortly. So when you think about some of the things 
uh, in the work that you've done, what are some of the things you've been passionate about when it comes to your job and your profession? Yeah, like most of the people who work in healthcare, I'm very passionate about people and making making a difference. That's why I joined. And also, I love being a nurse because for me, I have the power of, of changing life. And that's not a lot of professions who can say that. Uh, with my actions, I can make people recover. I can I can meet them with the, the moments they need, on the, the maximum need. And, and with my knowledge and all my skills, I can make them to go back on the society, back into the health, or if they have a terminal illness, I can make that transition a, a moment that they can remember and, they, and the relative also can share and to take part of it. Uh, for me, it's one of the professions that uh, you never get bored. Every day is different because every day you have meet different people from different backgrounds. Also, it's very challenging. Uh, it makes you use your brain uh, because everybody's unique and you need to find the solution for their problems. Uh, and then also, it stimulates me, my mind, to keep learning. And I think life is very important that you keep learning, to keep challenging yourself and, and try to grow uh, as a nurse. And nursing have all of that in abundance and, and, and is, uh, for me, is the best profession in the world. No, that, that's great to hear. And now, obviously, you, you've transitioned jobs since being a nurse, right? But you're still in the healthcare space. So prior to that, though, Tell us a little bit about your experience in healthcare and what were some of the things that worked well in the environments that you've been a part of? Yeah, um, obviously, I, I have 22 years of career of being a nurse. And I, as you mentioned, I had uh, several awards. And I was a senior nurse, a, a member of the executive team in some of the hospitals. And I was in charge of transformation. I was one of the first transformational nurses in the United Kingdom. And what I did is try to um, be inventive and try to find solutions outside the normal things to be able to deliver the best care possible with a very challenging situation because we have a growing population. I mean, America, we have also, people also have a lot of morbidities, obesity, diabetes, this, a lot of things that are similar in America. But the problem is here in the United Kingdom, we don't have infinite resources. We have lack of nurses, lack of doctors, and also the cost of health is getting aspiring out of control because the, the difference between the United Kingdom and America is here, the healthcare is free at the point of access. I mean, if you have any injury or illness, you don't pay anything. And that's the difference. That's why we need to be very inventive to be able to have delivered the, the best care possible on these circumstances. And I was in charge of that, and I'm very proud. And it worked well in some of the hospitals that I've been. I did change systems. I did reduce mortality, increase uptake of vaccines and everything. And a lot of the projects I did, they spread nationally. And also, I created, I was one of the first nurses who created a video game to engage uh, with other people to have the flu vaccine. I mean, I went outside the box and tried to find ways to engage with people and go to people with healthcare workers never gone before. I was one of the nurses who had a social media platform that I use social media a lot. Um, and now I have more, nearly 40,000 followers. I mean, I was a pioneer in a lot of things, but also I put a lot of pressure on me because obviously it was a visible figure and everything. Then I did don't know how to manage that bit of double figure of being a visible figure and also with uh, juggling all the pressure at work, the, 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 also the private life and everything. And it all came to a bit of a crashing. It was accelerated by the pandemic because during the pandemic, I left my office, I left my desk as a senior nurse and I decided to put my uniform again and I volunteered to work in the front line in the COVID intensive care on my city hospital. And I was there for nearly a year in the middle of the pandemic. And that had a massive toll onto my, onto my mental health that I don't think I was prepared. I wasn't ready to experience what I experienced in a very short period of time. Yeah, and, now that's, and that's actually a perfect transition, right? So, you know, you, you transition back into this role in, in the ICU. And, you know, naturally this is a show about the great resignation, you know, because this has happened due to the pandemic. So tell us a little bit about how the pandemic affected you. Well, as I say, the pandemic was a bit of a roller coaster with emotions, um, both emotionally and physical. It, it was very hard. On a daily basis, I went from joy to grief, uh, to grief to joy, to tears, to laughter in a matter of seconds. You know, also that makes that my anxieties, my fear, I, I felt insecurity, guilt, also a lot of anger, loneliness. I felt quite alone also because of the COVID pandemics and everything. And 
all these emotions was on a daily basis and multiplied by a hundred. And also uh, one of the things that I realized during the pandemic is your mortality. And inside my head, every time that I was putting my protection and I was opening the double doors to go into intensive care, there was a little voice at the back of my head that was telling me that I could be next, that I could be the next one who get COVID. I had colleagues who, and you know, who ended up in intensive care and nearly a thousand here in the, in, in the United Kingdom lost their life because, because of COVID. And every day that you go to work and you, and, and you take the hand over and you see that some of your colleagues are not there. And when you ask the nurse in charge, where are they? Say, oh, they have COVID, they have been isolated. You think you may be next. That's also, I was like a sponge. I was absorbing all these feelings and I was not very good at, and, you know, at letting them go. And then I, I, I was getting tired during the pandemic. And after a year, as I say, I was physically and emotionally exhausted. I was tired of the pain on the phone, the daily tears, the, the, the visits to say goodbye, the pain of the loneliness, and the broken life. Because... For me, all the patients that we lost, there's just not numbers. They have names, they have faces, they have families that I, I got a connection with them. And every time that I lost the patients, I felt guilty and, and left a scar onto my heart. Physiologically, I was not prepared to, to all that pressure, especially because I, I saw a bit of uh, anxiety and mental health, a bit of a weakness. Uh, uh, as a man, I come from Spain. The culture is a very macho culture. If you ask a boy, nowadays it's still the same. What do they want to be when they grow up? Most of them will say a footballer or, or a matador because uh, that's where the figure of a man still stands quite strongly on the onto the, the Spanish culture. And that's why when I start having some wobbles, I was totally on denial about my vulnerability. And I thought also as a, as a leader, I could not show that I was um, struggling in the middle of a pandemic when I had all these also colleagues next to me. And I pretended that I was okay when I wasn't. Wow. And, you know, I, I appreciate you, you sharing this. So when you think about this, you know, what are some of the things that you, you learned during the pandemic and really how did it start affecting your relationship with your job? I learned that, that having a struggle is not unusual and it happens to all of us at some point. I learned because I have an anxiety or I needed um, counseling. I'm not less as a, than a man. I'm not less of a, of a nurse. Otherwise, it makes me more human. It makes me a better nurse because I can now have a balance. Uh, as I say, I, I, I was carrying a burden of all these feelings that I have accumulated for years because nursing by itself is a quite draining career because you meet people on their vulnerable states and, and you absorb a lot of bad energy from a lot of people. But what happened in the pandemic was accelerated by a thousand. And also, as I say, because it was unknown, for me, the best, most frustrating, it was not to be able to, to do more, not to fight with a virus that nobody knew what it, exactly what it was at the beginning. And uh, and, and then the loneliness, because as a nurse, uh, uh, family plays a big role in, in supporting the patients and everything. And suddenly I became the family of that, uh, of that person uh, because the family couldn't come. And I learned also that to listen to myself, to listen to yourself and not to carry on when you barely can stand up, when you ended up a shift that you uh, need to go to, to hide in place and cry, uh, not to be ashamed of that, to seek uh, support a lot early, also to take the stigma of mental health. We were in extreme circumstances and extreme circumstances needs, uh, some people will be okay, some people will affect more like myself, but we need to offload. Yeah. And that is the problem. Going to the counseling or the psychologist, we need to take the stigma. For me, if you have physical health unbalance or have pain, you go to the GP, you go to the doctor and they, and, and they sort it out. If you have a mental health unbalance, you need to go to the psychologist or to the counselor and also they will help you. I feel ashamed that for 46 years, I deny my mental health and also I didn't know techniques how to regain the balance. And in the last year, since I left my profession, I have learned to listen to my body and also to apply techniques of regaining that balance of the mental health and identify when I need to slow down a bit or also I need to say, I'm sorry, I'm not helped, I'm not well today, I need something different and to be more honest with people because I think we need to be more honest with everybody, everybody around us because we are not superheroes, we are human beings like anybody else. Absolutely. And that, that self-awareness is, is, is really important. 
So now you go from this executive role back to the ICU. Obviously, you're a 20 plus year nurse. And then at some point, you know, you, you just got done describing a little bit about what it was like on the ICU. So you're going through a lot, you know, mentally, emotionally, and personally kind of leading up to and even during the pandemic. And then now in June of 2021, you decided, hey, you know, it, it, it's time for me to leave. So why ultimately did you decide to leave your job during the pandemic? Because everything around me was uh, falling apart and I was diagnosed with PTSD. My doctor told me that if you don't do something drastic, you will end up with medication or my doctor feared uh, because I, I was starting having some su suicidal thoughts. Wow. He thought that I will I will go to a dark hole that I, want, I didn't want to do that. And they, talking about it, they discovered that my anxiety at that, at that moment also I was I was on, on propanolol for my anxiety attacks and everything. And the next step was that, to put me on antidepressive. And also I had a conversation with the family and everything. And for the first time also, my family told me that they were afraid of me. And that for me was the hardest thing I, I ever heard from somebody. The people who you love the most, the people who are supposed to love you, suddenly they say, we are afraid of you because we don't know what triggered your attack because I was having mood swings, quite severe mood swings. Anything could um, make me very angry. Uh, and then I, I was I was having uh, waking up in the middle of the night with a lot of nightmares and so and everything. And that's why when I was the time to go back to my executive role and I sort of realized I cannot do that any longer because if I go to the executive role, I was so tired. I was also mentally exhausted. I couldn't retain any information and everything and say, as executive nurse, I'm making decisions who open wars or, 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 or hire other things and everything. If I make a wrong decision, people could die because I make the wrong decision. If I decided to move patients or to do any of uh, the decisions that an executive nurse does on a daily basis, that means that I could basically, I don't, I, I've realized that I wasn't fit to be on that position. And I decided to have a completely change of directions to find another job. And that's why I left um, because I thought myself that I went too far. I went to a crisis and the only way to avoid the more um, a deep crisis is was to change completely and to come um, out of the hospital because that was one of the triggers. Uh, I remember my my doctor, my counselor telling me that uh, one of the triggers for my anxiety is was me going into uh, into uh, the car park of the hospital and and walk to to the ward. My heart rate at that point was going so hard. Then they say for you not for just my only my sake, also for the sake of people around me and and my patients. I don't think I was safe to carry on uh, being a nurse at that point. And that's why I'm here today also because. I could have prevented that. I could have prevented to reach that point if I was uh, more aware of my mental health and also if I was more honest with myself when I have the first signs of any uh, anxiety or anything. But I was completely in denial and I didn't want uh, to be put the label to myself that I was not, because at that point I thought as a weakness, I was not strong enough on a moment that my country needed me and a moment that all the population needed me to be in the front line uh, battling this invisible enemy. I thought that was a weakness and I was ashamed of having this struggle. I'm not ashamed anymore. As I say, it's impossible. We're not made of iron. We have feelings. And, and as I say, some of the experiences I have lived, they will live for me forever. And some of the patients' eyes and conversation I have with their families and some of the goodbyes of children that they say goodbye to their dads, they will remember and they're still at the back of my brain forever. But I need to learn to live with that, but I also need to learn to be more honest and to listen to myself. That's why, that's why I left. For me, talking, hopefully other nurses will identify that I also have some problems and they will seek help a lot early what I did because the consequences of me not seeking help is that I couldn't carry on being a nurse and I'm trying to avoid that because that broke my heart also and I felt very guilty that I felt I was abandoning like a captain uh, I was abandoning a, sh a sinking ship and I needed to be the last one but I couldn't be in that ship anymore and for a long time also I felt shame of I left but thanks to the therapies and everything I'm not ashamed anymore and I want to help other people I want to help other health workers other people who may be listening that is no shame of having anxiety is no shame of having needed some help. As I say, it's one of the bravest things that anybody can do. If you need help, ask for help because the help is available. 
Joe, wow. I mean, I one, I before I even get to the next one, I just want to say thank you for being so vulnerable in in our discussion. Coming from a healthcare background myself, you know, I hear a lot of these stories, and so I'm I'm really certain that that this is going to be impactful for for a lot of people. So now you leave your your role, and so tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. What did you transition into? Yeah, what I transition is I become a teacher. I work for Health Education England, but what I do, I help people with a difficult background, with learning difficulties, um, autism, or any kind of disabilities to gain the skills to work on the health system. Because um, like in America, like a, a lot of the countries, we are short of healthcare workers, not just nurses. Um, a lot of things that what we, Health Education England, who is part of the NHS, have realized that with a little extra support, uh, we have a massive pool of talent that they can have a career in our health services. And I'm, I'm now um, working with these people. I have uh, 13 students that for a year I work, work with them. I'll put them in placements. I'll give all my skills. I'll teach everything I learned for 22 years of nursing. And then uh, hopefully then they will uh, get the job on our health services and they will be able to thrive and, and to be part of the society. Otherwise, all these people, they always been left behind because of disabilities and, and other, uh, other problems. And I love it. I love it because I go back to the same point, same reason why I became a nurse is to make a difference. Uh, and I think it's a theme there. And I'm glad that I managed to find a job as, as, as giving also uh, to these youngsters opportunity to experience the same um, exhilaration and the same excitement that I have experienced in the health system as uh, working there and try to make a difference. And, and also, the other side of my job is also I became a, a mental health advocate because I decided to talk about my mental health when I read an article here in the, in the United Kingdom that stated that over 100 nurses have committed suicide because of their stigma of mental health. And they thought that our uh, regulator will throw them out of, of being a nurse because they thought that to be a nurse, you couldn't have prob mental health problems. When I read that, say, hang on a minute, I need to do something. I have, a, you know, I have this image, I have this social media presence. I, I can access to um, a lot of press and, and talk a lot of uh, journalists and everything. I need to make my vulnerability know to say if, if I, Somebody of the nurses who thinking to still a shame of having uh, mental health problems, they still a shame. If I can help them to say, look, if Joe is still uh, in, you know, still having uh, being visible and everything, and and he's managed to overcome uh, on the way to overcome this mental health, and and he's still a nurse and he's still part of the society and everything, they can do it also. That's why I decided to speak up. And also because I'm fed up of the society putting labels to people, and I want them also to break this stigma and this label that mental health is bad. It's, right. it's as good as physical health, right. and we need to have a balance. No, absolutely. And you know, the themes you touched on earlier about, you know, the real reason you got into nursing was to help people. And so, yes, you've done that, but now you're helping people in so many different ways, right? So you are staying true to the themes that, that that have always driven you. So it's awesome to kind of see that, you know, happening in practice now. So as we think about some of the the advice, right? I, I always want my, my listeners to, to get it, obviously hearing from folks who have gone through this, uh, but they may be in similar positions themselves and may not know what to do. So what advice would you give to people who may have a similar experience as yours, healthcare or even not? I think healthcare is very, very pointed at, at this time, but really don't know what to do next. What advice would you give them? Um, talk to your nurse in charge. There will be resources in, in every hospital to support people uh, or staff who, who have mental health uh, or have anxiety or, or anything. Don't be ashamed to asking for help. I think that's the biggest barrier that we have at the moment, especially men like me, uh, is that stigma attached. But when I overcome that barrier, when when my managers show me and say, Joe, you need some um, some help, and say you cannot, you're not allowed to come back to work until you see the, the counselor. For me, that changed my life, yeah. and I'm very grateful for that nurse. Seek help, and also for other people who work in the hospital, have a look for if your colleague suddenly is a bit more quiet, is a bit more withdrawn. Don't ask just, are you okay, and expect to say yes. Like 99% of the people who ask, are you okay, they say yes. Make sure you have time and tell them, I noticed that you're a bit more withdrawn. I noticed that you're a bit more quiet. Do you want to, have, do you want to go for a walk, or do you want to have a conversation or something? Make it a bit more meaningful and dig a bit more. And if you're still seeing them wobbling a bit, just be there for them uh, and say, look, 
uh, I know you may be having a problem. Um, I'm here to help you. Uh, if you have anxiety, not a problem. Share also maybe your problems. I think we need to learn to share more, especially men, to share that we all human beings and we all have up and downs in our emotions and also in like the, the physical health. And we have good moments, bad moments, and we need to be a bit more aware and not to close our eyes and say, okay, he's a bit needs a bit of uh, me time on her own. Maybe that's true, but be a bit more curious. We need to be a bit more curious about each other and support each other better. Yeah, definitely. And this also sounds like ha having that empathy too, right? Yeah. So now what more do you think employers could be doing to better support employees during this time? Yeah, for me, it's been a before and after the pandemic. Before the, the pandemic, having access to a counselor, having an access to to support, it was quite difficult. You needed to have a referral to occupational health. You need to wait, uh, sometimes wait for months. The good thing that happened with uh, during the pandemic is that resource was already there, yeah. and you, I, I needed, I didn't need to wait three months to be referred to a counselor. The counselor was in the hospital, and I think that should. Be, for me, it should be compulsory that there should be more available, more counselors as part of the staff of the hospitals to check on the on the staff, and they should have like an office that like like you can go and book an appointment yourself without telling anybody else. You should be more available uh, and should be more visible. And also, they should for me they should make it uh, more easy to disclose your, your mental health or better ways, more easy to have to access that. My fear now is that the pandemic, we are forgetting about the pandemic a bit more, is that we will go back to the old system yeah. because all that costs money, all that having this console and everything. But I always say that on a long term, it saves a lot of money. Imagine that if I need counseling, I need to wait three months. That's three months that will be off. Uh, if I have the counselor there, I'm not saying the same day, but the day after or the day after that, I mean, I will go by, be able to go back to work and I will not be able to reach the crisis point that I reached. I mean, if I have the counselor, early intervention, yeah. he, he always saved life. Definitely. That's for me. I think we need to learn to spend, to invest in our staff because at the end, it's always cheaper in the long term. Yeah, definitely having that big picture thinking. You know, Joe, <laughs> this was, it was a real honor to hear you speak and I'm I'm really glad that you know, you've been so transparent with us today. You've been so vulnerable with us, and really sharing your story with, with the world, right? And obviously, it's been more than just this podcast, right? And we'll we'll talk, uh, you know, more about that. But you wrote a book about this, right? And so, tell us a little bit about, you know, Destiny and Hope. Before we wrap up, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about Destiny and Hope. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. That Destiny and Hope. It was part of the. Of my therapy, part of my therapy, because as a man, I'm not very good at expressing myself. Then my counselor said, "Bo, why don't you uh, do an exercise?" And he, he he gave me a challenge. I'm I'm like any man. I love challenges and I love to to get um, you know a bit competitive. And, and and then I wrote. I said, "Don't need to do anything. Just before you go to bed, write one emotion that you have that day." I did start writing anger, and then I start frustration, uh, and and then I got in that habit, and that also. A bit help, and then after I was doing that for a couple of weeks, I'd say, okay, now you need to tell me why you have that emotion. And I was then suddenly I was doing. I'm angry because you know we were short of my size PPE today, or I was frustrated because a new variant have appeared in South America, or okay. all this, and then. Surely that is like somebody have opened, uh, taken, you know, the cork of a uh, sparkling wine. And I was able to express my emotions a lot easy because of that. And next thing that I did is start sharing my emotions with my loved ones. And that also broke a barrier because when when I was hurting so much, I was I did what I come to survive. I had chalk mode, you know, I went into a, a ball yeah. because everything was so hurting too, so much. I was basically create uh, like a shield uh, around me and I didn't want anything to come out but also I didn't let anybody to come in the fact that I was writing that was the first time that I was opening a bit more and the people close to me they were able to share and and what I was living one thing went to another and and then somebody told me well, why don't you write a blog about your experience and I did wrote a blog and I published that in uh, I think it was February 2021 over a year ago and that got over a million views. Wow. Uh, and I say, well, okay. And then somebody approached me and say, why don't you write your story? And then one thing went to another. And 
I did love my therapy. My, um, the drug story was very therapeutic, but also, but I did wrote an honest book about not just the good things that I've done in nursing, but also the struggles. And I wanted to share the dark side that I have lived and the hope, because my theme is hope and, and destiny. And ho- what happened also when I lost the hope? Right. Because they also, as a senior manager on the NHS before that, I had a few encounters, uh, a few occasions that I also lost hope for bad decisions I made, for uh, other things that, uh, and also the theme. And I said, well, if I share that, and, also, uh, as, uh, and that will help other people. Uh, and also give my theories about nursing and, and think change and how to make change large scales. It's a very, I think, a very honest, interesting book. You don't need to be a nurse to read it. It's just the story of a young lad who had very ambitions, who go to United Kingdom and change the healthcare system for hope for the better, but also the impact that had of my mental health and other things. And it's a very honest book that I hope people um, read it. Um, uh, they will like it. It's, it's, it's on Amazon. If anybody wants to like it worldwide, it can be can be there. And all the profits go to charity. Charity here in the United Kingdom who help families who have lost loved ones because of COVID. Wow. You know, look, shining a light on mental health is is so important during these times and during all times, but especially during these times. So again, I want to, you know, thank you for, for joining us. I look forward to following your work. You know, I'm sure your message is going to really resonate with a lot of our listeners. So you'd mentioned kind of where you can find the book, but we'd also want you to uh, give us, give it the folks, you know, where can folks either find, follow you, support you, any you know, you're, yeah. you're a roaring nurse, right? So yeah. where, where can they, where can people find you? They have, have they can find me on Twitter. I'm roaring nurse. I, I'm also quite an activist. Um, I like to be make nursing a bit more visible. Um, also, at the moment, I'm raising money for for a um, for a hospice uh, because I'm gonna try to be the fastest pine to run a marathon. I'm gonna dress up as a pine of beer <laughs> and try to beat try to beat the Guinness World Record at the London Marathon the second of October. This in six month time. I mean, the people also can follow my journey. How I went. How I'm gonna go through the pain of running a marathon dressed as a pine of Guinness, but wow. also to celebrate, and I want to celebrate all the healthcare workers that they work during the pandemic. That's why I dress up as a beer, and that's why I want to have a funny way to say thank you, and also raise money for a, for a charity. I mean, they can follow me, as I say, Twitter, Rolling Nurse, Instagram, Rolling Nurse, Facebook, I keep it a bit more private for my family and picture of my holidays. Yeah. I don't think anybody wants to see that. <laughs> and, and also I have a website that's a bit out, out of date, but it's roaringnurse.com that people can find me that. Uh, and you know, if people can email me, um, yeah. if I'm happy, you know, anybody needs any, anything, I'm, I'm always happy, uh, happy to help people. That, that's my passion. Yeah. And that's why I became a nurse. That's why when you ask me, will you come to talk here to why I left podcast? I say, yeah, no, no problem. And, you know, I'm, I love to connect with people. And I think as a human beings, we need to connect with people. And that's one of the biggest impacts I learned from the pandemic is the, the inability to connect and the fact that isolation, that's, that also had a lot of impact on my mental health. As a human beings, we need to socialize. You know, I'm here to connect with people. And if connection lead to uh, improve and, and make the world better, that's why I'm here for. Definitely. No, that, that's great to hear. And that's exciting. You could definitely, I, I, you hear it through your words and, you know, you can tell that you, you live by it. And that London Marathon, so running as a pint of beer, I guess that, that is a form of hydration, right? So, you know, I, that, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll take it. That'll be good. So I'll, I'll make sure yeah. I, I, I check you out. Uh, it's, a, it's a non-alcoholic beer. As a nurse, <laughs> I will run with a non-alcoholic beer. Alcohol. But, uh, you know, and I, I, will, I wanted to celebrate. And also, it's one of my bucket lists. That's all the things I've done after the pandemic. I decided to follow my bucket list. It was to have a Guinness World Record. Mm. And I need to run under four hours. To have the Guinness World Record, I need to run under four hours. Okay. That's uh, itself is quite difficult. I'm getting there. Um, I managed to do half marathon in one hour and 39 minutes. I just need a bit more longer and, and things. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed, oh, yeah. I'll have time. You'll, you'll and, do it. Yeah. I, I, I know I know you, you you got the drive for sure. So, yeah. well, I don't want to keep you from training right right now. So no, no. I just want to say, you know, thank you again. And and look, so that'll do it uh, for us to, in today's episode. Again, I want to thank, you know, Joe. I want to show you my t-shirt. Oh, also, yeah, nurses, nurse? not all superhero wear capes. Oh, I love you know? that. I love that. Yeah. 
That is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's perfect. So look, I want to, you know, Joe, I want to thank you again uh, for joining us today. And I'll be sure to put some information about where you can find him in our show notes. Uh, so I hope everyone has a, has a great week and I'll see you next time. Joe, take care. Good seeing you. Take care. great resignation, people leaving their jobs in droves, there's a lot of buzz happening in the job market of late. Now, did you or someone you know leave your job during the pandemic and want to share your story? We've been having some really good conversations in this space, so if you're interested, I'd love to have you join the program. If so, here's how you can do it. First, you can email us at hello at whyileft.co. That's hello at whyileft.co or visit us online at whyileft.co. That's whyileft.co. Look forward to having you join the conversation. Thanks again for listening to Why I Left. Be sure to join us next time for more stories from the Great Resignation. Visit us at www.whyileft.co. That's whyileft.co. And subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.